Romans. We're in Romans chapter 1. Our series here at Calvary Chapel on Sunday mornings is called The Problem Solved, where we look at the big problem and God's solution. A bit more about that in a minute. Um, I want to thank Pastor Joe for uh, bringing the word uh, last Sunday. Uh, we listened to it as we were driving back from Colorado, where we went whitewater rafting, horseback riding, and uh, it, nobody died <laughs> in our raft, which I'm really thankful for, and nobody fell out. I don't know if you've ever been whitewater rafting. It was our first time. We had a great time. Um, uh, and, you know, Pastor Joe shared a message on Christianity and politics, which is a fun topic, isn't it? Uh, you know, we never want to shy away from talking about difficult topics. Uh, I think once you stop talking about difficult or controversial topics, you can quickly become irrelevant. Um, and so, so we always want to uh, be open to interpreting our culture and what's happening in the culture based on uh, a Christian biblical worldview and, and uh, what the... Bible says, and so as, as I was listening to that message uh, with my family, with my wife in the car, um, here's what I got from it. We need to pray for our leaders. Um, we need to prioritize the gospel. The gospel is our message, and this is what changes lives and changes the world, and so we need to prioritize that. Um, and then, and then uh, another takeaway for me from that message was be careful what you post online. I always, and I know we've all done this, right, where you post something, and then, uh, and then you're like, wait a minute, maybe that wasn't a really good idea. And then you, and then, you know, maybe you retract it, maybe you don't, but, but, uh, but I always try now, I'm, I'm getting in the habit of before I post something, I think about, okay, well, what if somebody from, you know, a different camp, per se, or a different tribe, or what if somebody who, who disagrees with me, what if they see this, what will they get from it? You know, what, how will that... Um, will that bring them closer to Jesus or farther away? And so I'm not saying don't post anything controversial, but I'm just saying let's make sure we filter it through the gospel and we filter it through, through uh, uh, you know, what Jesus has done in our lives. And if you want to dig further into, into this whole issue of Christianity and politics, um, go to our website. I shared a message on uh, July 4th of 2021, and it's a message called Freedom. And uh, so you can just go to the message page, and there's a little search bar. You can search freedom, and it'll pop right up. And, and in that message, if you weren't here for it or you don't remember, I, I go through um, basically a biblical theology of freedom. In other words, what does the Bible say about freedom, right? Because Genesis chapter 1, God says, or not Genesis chapter 1, uh, maybe chapter 2, says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden except a couple, except the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? And then looked at slavery. God's, God um, set the Hebrew people free from slavery. So he just kind of walk, walked that through. And then I talk about, well, what is the role of a Christian as a citizen? right? And what is the proper role of a Christian as a citizen, especially in the United States of America? Because this is, the U.S. is different than you know, China, Venezuela, North Korea. Amen? <laughs> Aren't you glad? Right? So the U.S. has a different form of government that empowers the citizen. Anyways, so I talk all about that in that message, and that would be maybe a part two of uh, what Pastor, Pastor Joe shared. Um, so just wanted to give you that resource. Um, also want to let you know, um, uh, my wife and I this week, we're going to be heading to San Diego uh, to attend a uh, Turning Point Faith Pastor Summit. We've been invited to go there, and we're actually going to be talking about what... Um, you know, what's happening in the country and how the church should respond to what's happening. So appreciate your prayers. We're looking forward to it. And I'm um, just really uh, honored and grateful to be invited to, to go to that. So, all right. So uh, the title of my message today is What's Up with the Wrath of God? What's Up with the Wrath of God? So Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. 
For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that we can come before you, that we can gather, that we have the freedom to be here, to worship you, to talk about the Bible, to think together about deep, important, life-changing truths. So we thank you for that. Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy and your kindness, your love. Lord, we do pray for our leaders. Father, we pray for uh, President Biden, Vice President Harris, the whole cabinet, Lord. We pray for Governor Ducey. We pray for the, the leaders, all the senators and congressmen. Pray for Mayor McFarland, the city council members, all those in authority, Lord, as your word tells us, we pray for them so that we could continue worshiping you, Lord, so that we could live peaceful and quiet lives, Lord. And I pray that they would lead in such a way to guarantee our peace and our quiet lives, Lord. Father, we do also pray for salvation for all of these individuals. God, for we know that if people die without you, they will spend eternity apart from you, Lord. And so we pray for salvation, God, that you would save these people. Lord, some of us here need a miracle. We're going through tough, difficult, seemingly insurmountable uh, situations that we don't know what to do. God, but we know you, and you are a miracle worker. We just sang it, Lord. You are a miracle worker. And I pray for those that are, are stuck right now, are, are caught in just a situation maybe beyond their control or because of their bad choices. Father, would you please show yourself strong in the lives of my brothers and sisters. And Lord, I pray for all of us that we would see today that the Bible is a relevant book, that this is your message to us. And that this is the way that we can know you, and that we can be strong in our faith. I pray our faith would grow and increase today. Lord, give me wisdom. Give me the ability to communicate today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dude Perfect. Anybody here ever heard of Dude Perfect? Not many. Okay. So my kids like to watch a YouTube channel, uh, which is Five Guys, one of the world's most popular YouTube channels, and they call themselves Dude Perfect. Uh, some of their videos, <coughs> excuse me, they have a lot of trick shot videos, um, uh, you know, a bunch of other types of videos, but one of the types of videos, excuse me, one of the types of videos that they do is called Stereotypes. And uh, for example, they'll do, they'll do movie-goer stereotypes. And, and they'll poke fun at, say, somebody in a movie with what they call the obnoxious laughter. Like, so somebody in a movie, and they're laughing out loud, and so they'll, they'll, you know, they'll do these little skits and poke fun at that. Or the snack smuggler. The snack smuggler. Somebody who smuggles in their own snacks to movies. Anybody relate to that? <laughs> All right. Caught. Uh, or the snoozer, right? The person who's snoozing in the movie. And these videos are super hilarious. And, and, and these guys are, are Christian, by the way, although their videos aren't necessarily uh, promoting Christian uh, Christianity. Um, and, they, and then they have another video called Airplane Stereotypes, where you meet the nervous flyer or the kid that stares. Ever been on a flight and there's like a kid staring at you? <laughs> and then the talker where you sit down next to somebody and they just incessantly talk your ear off. But in every one of these stereotype videos, 
there is somebody called the rage monster. The rage monster. Where they just go absolutely upset and they lose control. So just to give you an idea, and I never show video clips during my sermon, but today we're starting. Here's what happens when Cody forgets to buy tapioca pudding at the grocery store. So check out this video. All right. I have a feeling they're going to get a few more hundred hits on their video today after this message. So it's funny and it's hilarious. And you're probably saying, Pastor Pat, why in the world are we talking about this? I came here to learn the Bible. Well, listen, real rage is not funny, is it? Angry outbursts in real life are anything but funny. And so when you hear a phrase like the wrath of God, it's really easy for you to have the misunderstanding of God's wrath or God's anger. I mean, we've all seen uh, outbursts of wrath in our life. Maybe we've even been the guilty one to have an outburst of wrath. Whose heart doesn't break when you hear about some raging lunatic that beats his kids because they're upset? You know, on and on it goes. I don't have to, to, to say too much about this because we're all familiar with a real rage in life. And so that is not the wrath of God. God is not raging against people. He's not emotionally out of control. God is never irrational. And so that being the case, then, it begs the question, well, what then is the wrath of God? I mean, we know that for the most part, anger is wrong. Now, Jesus equates anger with murder. And there could be some isolated instances where anger and even killing could be justified biblically. But we recognize for the most part that anger as... Uh, Theologian, theologian John Stott says, anger is a manifestation of our sinful human nature, and it's incompatible with our new life in Christ. Galatians 5.20, which is a section that talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian, one of the, the works of the flesh, the works of what we call our old nature, <coughs> is fits of rage. And so how could we attribute anything like that to the Holy Spirit? perfect God. So there's nothing toxic, irrational, or malicious about God's anger. God does not lose his temper. God does not fly into a rage. And unfortunately, I think this is the picture that many non-believers or, or pre-Christians have of God. And they, they see, you know, God as an angry old man with lightning bolts in his hands, for example. But God's wrath is a reaction to sin. It's a moral, it's an ethical reaction to sin. It's a, a deeply personal, if you will, abhorrence of evil. It's what we could call a holy hostility. It's God's refusal to condone sin or to let it go unchecked. So God does not neglect sin. This is a very important point. Now, we have no problem understanding. If I, if I tell you God is love, God has perfect love, holy love, everybody's going to agree with that. I mean, that just makes sense of, of intuitively that God is, God is all loving. In the same way that God has perfect love, he has perfect anger, something that we don't know, right? Because we've never experienced perfect anger. But, but, but this has helped me to think of this, if I think of it this way. Imagine a human father, a good father, a loving father. Uh, if that father had maybe, say, a 10 or 11-year-old son or daughter, and that son or daughter got beat up, 
sexually abused, maybe even raped. And let's say that, that they had to go to the emergency room and the father's at work. And so a policeman or a doctor or a social worker, somebody calls the, the father and he finds out what happened to his son or daughter. If he responds, uh, yeah, no problem. I kind of am working. I'm involved in an important project right now. I'm sure they'll be okay. Uh, don't really worry about it, you know, that they got abused and that they got molested and all of this. Now, if that was the reaction of a parent, I think we'd all agree that parent does not love their child. What would be a godly reaction? Anger. Anger because love has been violated. Because the object of the father's love has been abused. And so if, if as a father, I'm not angry at a sin that was committed against my child, the argument could be made that I don't properly love my child. You could say it this way. Um, love demands hatred of sin. Love demands hatred of that which violates love. So God is angry at sin. God is not angry at people. Do you understand? God is not angry at individuals. There are some exceptions to this, but God is angry at sin. And so to diminish the wrath of God is to diminish the love of God. And so we have to talk about this. If God does not care about sin, which ruins the object of his love, how is it possible that he loves at all? You see, God cannot look upon sin without doing something about it. So God's wrath, when you hear the phrase God's wrath, think of God's judgment. God's wrath flows out of his holiness. God's wrath is the execution of judgment. And if there's no judgment for sin, if there's no consequence for bad or for wrong, then there's no morality. Then there's no sin. If there's no consequence for sin, how can there be sin? God is not God. If God is not God, we're all doomed. All right, so let's th think with me a little bit more. Now, in Scripture, we see God's wrath displayed in three different ways. Number one, we see God's wrath dis displayed on a continual present tense basis, which is what our text describes, and we're going to look at that in more detail here in just a minute. But second, in Scripture, we see God's wrath displayed on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, for example, sometimes through angels execute God's wrath. Sometimes we see forces of nature executing God's wrath. Uh, sometimes we see other nations executing God's wrath. One example of this would be Isaiah chapter 10, where God proclaims that he's going to use the nation of Assyria as a, quote, rod of his anger, going against the people of his wrath. So Isaiah 10 is an example where one nation's coming against another nation, and God is saying, this is an execution of my wrath against these people because they've violated my covenant with them. Another example is in 2 Samuel chapter 24 where King David sins and then an angel was used as an instrument of God's wrath. And uh, so that's the second way we see God's wrath in scripture, case by case basis. So this begs the question, do we see this today? Do we see these case by case basis of God's wrath being executed today? And I think a good answer for that and I haven't thought really deeply about this, but I think initially I would say we don't know. For example, when you see one nation going against another nation, when you see a natural disaster, is that God's wrath? I think my answer would be I don't know because I'm not seeing in the heavenly. The only reason we know these instances are because they're in the scriptures. And it says specifically this is an execution of my wrath. Um, so the third expression, though, of God's wrath in scripture uh, which is probably the most notable, which is the most that I think we're familiar with as Christians if you've been reading the Bible for any length of time, is the day of God's wrath at the end, the great tribulation. So this is the, the time and probably the fullest expression of God's wrath. And you can read all about that in uh, Revelation chapter 6 to 19. That's, that's God's wrath very literally being poured out upon this earth in this final judgment. And that's where all manner of evil and wickedness uh, will finally be uh, made right. Okay, 
So, before we go any farther, I want to make sure everybody's clear here. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian here today, God's wrath against your sin has been placed upon Jesus Christ. So you are not a recipient of God's wrath. Jesus is a recipient of God's wrath on the cross for you. This is why in Isaiah chapter 53, it says God was pleased to strike Jesus. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Isaiah chapter 53. So we need to remember that. So God's wrath against us, and we deserve God's wrath because we've sinned, but Jesus took that punishment for us. For us. Okay, so just to summarize, God's wrath in Scripture revealed three different ways. The day of wrath, Revelation 6 to 19, isolated incidents that we see in Scripture, and then on this continual present tense basis. And so that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of our time here. God's wrath being poured out on a continual present tense basis. And I believe that this explains our culture. How God's wrath explains our culture. So let's go back into scripture. Uh, in verse 19 and 20 of chapter 1, we see that there's a revelation of God. So what we're going to see here is a revelation of God. We're going to see a rejection of God. And then we're going to see a response to um, or the results of rejecting God. And so in verses 19 and 20, we see this revelation of God. Let me read it again. Revelation, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 1, verse 19. It says, what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Brothers and sisters, this is a very important passage of Scripture. This is a critical passage of Scripture for you to understand. You don't have to memorize it, but you should know where it is. Romans 1.20. What this verse is saying is that God has revealed himself to the entire world. God has revealed himself to every person through creation. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. That's Psalm 19, verse 1. Watch a sunrise. Look at a sunset. On a clear night, look up at the sky and count the stars if you can. How about the animal kingdom? Go to a zoo or go out in nature or watch some videos about these amazing animals that have been created. Most of us have been to the mountains and seen the, beauti the beautiful trees and the, the mountains and, and the different streams and rivers. Have you ever been to the ocean and you just look out at this vast body of water? And listen, this all reveals God's glory. This all reveals two things, verse 20 says. It reveals his eternal power, for who else can create something like this? And it re reveals his Godhead, or another word for that would be his deity, his godness, if you will. Creation reveals God's glory. I mean, who makes it rain? I mean, sometimes in Arizona you say, no one. <laughs> <laughs> who makes the trees grow? What about human beings? I mean, just look around at this room. No two human beings are, are alike. I mean, what, what beauty. How amazing is that? If you really want to dig into this, read Job chapter 38 to 40. Some of the most profound scripture in all of Bible. Part of that, as God is questioning Job, and Job is really bewildered at his suffering and wondering where, wondering where God is in his suffering. Have you ever been there? And, and God says to Job in Job 38, 19, where is the way to the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place? I mean, these are just mind-boggling questions. And then God continues to question Job. He says, can you hunt the prey for the lion?" Can you satisfy the appetite of young lions when they crouch in their den or lurk in their lairs to lie in wait? Who provides food for the raven? 
when its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food. And it's just, I mean, these are just very, very powerful passages of Scripture, which, which, which clearly shows the eternal power and deity of God. And so what Paul is writing here in Romans is that everyone can look at that. Everyone can look at creation and recognize that there is a God. Now, to be clear, this is not salvation knowledge. It's not salvation knowledge. But it is being able to recognize that there's a God. He's, he's eternally powerful. His intelligence, his, his transcendence is, is beyond humanness. But then... We move on from the revelation of God in verses 19 and 20 to what the bulk of this passage is about, the rejection of God. It begins in, in verse 18 where it says, The wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who, and this is a key phrase here, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So we have this revelation of God. The revelation of God that I've just described is called general revelation. There's two types of revelation uh, in terms of God revealing himself. There's general re revelation and specific revelation. Or some say general revelation and special revelation. Um, so God reveals himself to humanity, as we just read, through general revelation. But he also reveals himself through special revelation. So I'm going to give you two ways that God reveals himself in terms of general, re general revelation. Right, number one, I've already talked about nature. Right? But another way that God reveals himself is the human conscience. The human conscience. Some also say history, but I'm not going to talk about that. So, but general revelation of God is something that's always there. But let's think about human conscience. Specifically, our sense of right and wrong. Our sense of right and wrong. Why is it that any culture that you visit, whether it's a primitive culture without education or technology, or whether it's the most advanced culture, why is it that every culture would say it's wrong to take an innocent life? Every single, every single culture. And, and some, some would counter by saying, well, no, there's certain tribes in Africa that they just, they just kill people because they kill people. But if you look carefully, they kill people from another tribe, not their own tribe. So this is the, the, the general revelation of God. He's put in this moral conscience. It's one of the best arguments for the existence of God. Because if there is no God, and I know even some of our high school students who are now back to school are saying, hey, my professors are saying that there's no God. You know, that, that, that the only thing that exists is what you can see. And this is one of the best arguments for the existence of God. If that is true, if, if the only thing that exists is what you can see, you know, other people, atoms, matter, if you will, this is what's called naturalism, right? The only thing that exists is, is matter. If this is true, how in the world do you explain conscience? How do you explain the sense of right and wrong? Because if there is no God, it's not wrong for me to walk up and slap Richard in the face. Where does morality, let, let's actually try that. No, I wouldn't do that. But, but honestly, why is that wrong? Well, you all would agree, even, even if there's, there's people here who don't believe in God at all, you would agree that that's just wrong I, if I don't have a reason to do that, let alone taking another life. So this is, this is general revelation. This is conscience. It's one of the strongest arguments for the existence of God. All right, now, in addition to to general revelation, there's special or specific revelation. Now, this is God's specific revelation of himself to an individual or to a group of people uh, through miraculous means. Uh, many of us have read stories about people that have, ha that have had dreams about Jesus. I've read many stories about uh, Muslim people who have had dreams about Jesus. That would be special revelation. Uh, different visions. When an angel appears to somebody, that's a special revelation. Uh, Jesus coming in the flesh, God in the flesh, that's special revelation. That's God revealing himself in a special way. Perhaps the most important special revelation is right here. The Bible is specific revelation. 
about God. Okay, this is important. Everybody get it? We have general revelation, so hopefully you can talk about this to your friends. General revelation, nature and conscience. Special revelation, Jesus Bible. Right? Really important. So this helps us answer the question. Have you ever thought about this? What happens if somebody dies without ever hearing about Jesus? You ever thought about that? It's a good question, isn't it? So this verse helps us answer that question because this verse tells me that, that nobody dies without general revelation. Nobody dies without being able to say, there's a God, eternal power, godly attributes, transcendence. And, and here, here's, here's what I believe happens. Everyone has access to general revelation. General revelation, as I mentioned, is not enough to save but I believe if a person responds favorably to general revelation, God will be faithful to give them specific revelation. So in other words, if a person somewhere looks at the sky and says, man, there's got to be some kind of God. I mean, this, this, just, this just didn't come into That if they have a searching heart and they're responding favorably, that God's going to be faithful to maybe send them a witness or they'll pick up a Bible, or, or they'll, they'll watch something or hear something. Why? Because they're seeking, right? He who seeks, finds. But many people, if not most people, reject the general revelation, don't they? They, they look around and say, no, it's all just, it's all just natural. It just, it just kind of happened. And so this is Paul's message now in, in, in the bulk of our passage. He's dealing with people who what he calls in verse 18 who suppress the truth, who suppress the truth. Do you know what suppress means, right? It means to, to put down by authority or force. We could think of uh, suppressing uh, maybe police or military that suppress a riot. We could think if you have a cold, you take suppressants, right, to diminish the symptoms, to hold down the symptoms. If there's a fire, you want to suppress that fire by keeping, keeping it from spreading. So verse 18 is talking about people who suppress the truth. We want to advance the truth, but people who reject general revelation, they're going to suppress the truth. So in other words, if you look at nature, you see the beauty, the complexity, uh, there is a responsibility with seeing the beauty and the complexity to acknowledge God as the creator. To not do so, to not believe, is an act of rebellion against common sense. To not believe that there's a God by looking at beauty and nature, you're rebelling against common sense. You can't be forced to believe, but if you don't believe, you're responsible. You're accountable now. So nature, the created order, holds people responsible to believe in a God of eternal power. So verse 21 goes on, and it says that when people suppress the truth about God, they don't give him glory or gratitude, something happens. See, they, it says because although they knew God, they didn't glorify him, they weren't thankful, what happens? Their thinking changes. It says they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. All right, and so, so now we're going to talk about the results of rejecting God. The rejection of God, the results of rejecting God. So verse 21, the New Living Translation says that they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like, and as a result, their minds become dark and confused. So you reject general revelation. You start to then think futilely, like futile thoughts, dark and confused, then th this leads to deception, and then eventual, eventual, uh, eventually this will lead to idolatry where you begin to worship. I mean, if you don't believe in God, you're rejecting general revelation. The human heart was made to worship. You're going to start worshiping something else. And when it says your heart is darkened here, the hearts were darkened, the, the heart is obviously not talking about the physical organ that, that pumps blood throughout our body. The heart is the entire inner life. It's, it's your soul, it's your emotions, it's your intellect, it's your will. It's where you form your commitments. And so when anyone rejects God, it says here that their hearts are darkened. It means your thinking is now going sideways, and then your whole inner life is going in the wrong direction. You remove God, 
you say, no, I don't, I don't believe. I don't believe in God. I don't, I don't believe that, that God exists. So you're not going to acknowledge his existence, his intelligence, his power, his transcendence. If there's no God, all that exists is the, is the material world. What have you done? You've taken away the foundation of truth. 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul says, um, this is the purpose for 1 Timothy, is I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, in the church. Then he defines the church or the house of God. He says, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Other translation says the foundation of the truth. So do you know that we are the foundation of truth because we're, Bible people, because we're God's people. So we have the foundation of truth. So if you, if you take God out of the picture, you're not building on the right foundation. So now your, your whole thinking is wrong and your heart is going to follow. Your whole inner life is, is going to be whacked. It's going to be way off because there's no foundation. So how then do you answer the big questions of life? Like, what happens after I die? Well, because your thinking is off, you've moved away from the foundation to say, well, what happens after I die? You're going to come up with something like, well, my spirit is going to be reborn into another body based on how good of a person I am. Right? There's a lot of people that believe that. Or you're going to say, well, God doesn't exist, so, so I'm just going to cease to exist. I just won't exist anymore. So if, if you're going to disregard God, if you're not going to respond to general revelation, how are you going to answer the question, what is the purpose of life? Why am I here? I mean, you have to, everybody has to answer that question. What is the purpose of life? Well, if you disregard God and you have futile, futile thoughts, you're going to come up with something like, oh, I'm you know, going to make the world a better place or I'm going to get as much money as I can or, or ha have, have as much happiness as I can or, or I'm just going to, you know, do whatever I feel like I want to do. There, 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 see, there's no grounding there. There's no, there's no true purpose there. Th this is futile thoughts. And I'm not saying that people that don't believe in God don't have good intentions or they're bad people. They're just futile and foolish because they've taken away that foundation. And, and let's maybe go a little bit farther and try to explain our culture this way. If you suppress the truth about God and then, and then you have these questions about, well, who am I? Like, really? Like, I mean, really, who am I? Because I don't feel like I look. I'm, I'm confused about who I am. A and then, and then you're, going to, you're going to have this idea that, well, I, I may be in a man's body, but I don't feel like a man, so maybe I can live as a woman. Or I'm in a woman's body and I don't feel like a woman, so maybe I can live as a man. Do you see now? We would say, well, that's, that's futile. And my heart goes out. And, and if, if people listening to me genu genuinely have these, these uh, issues or these problems, my heart goes out to you. And I love you. But, but this is confusion and, and, and you're going to struggle because you're, you're going to be sadly deceived because the people you got your information from, as verse 22 says, professing to be wise, they became fools. And there are so many people that profess to be wise, and they even have degrees that say they are wise, but when you listen to what comes out of their mouth or what they write, it's just utter foolishness. Why? Because they rejected general revelation. They rejected general revelation. And so maybe the day after they reject general revelation, they're not foolish. They're not, you know, there's, but as it goes on, as verse 21 says, it's, they, they're, 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 they're not glorifying God. They're not thankful to God. So they're become, they become futile in their hearts and their foolish hearts were darkened. So it starts off with rejecting God. It moves on to futile thinking darkened hearts, and then eventually, verse 23, into idolatry. Idolatry, which is worship of something that's not God. Idolatry is worshiping something that's, th th that's not God. Verse 23 actually talks about worshiping um, things like birds, four-footed animals, creeping things. This is not so much true in our time. 
You won't, you won't really run across people who worship dogs. I mean, we, we are dog lovers, but we don't worship dogs. Not a cat lover. Any cat lovers here? No, don't raise your hand. Don't want to know who you are. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just being silly. So, but but you, don't, you don't worship animals. You don't worship insects. So maybe people in other times would worship animals. But what, what's, what's our idolatry today? What do people worship today? Stuff, material things, and they worship themselves. They look in the mirror and they say, well, I'm... I'm God. I'm my own God, right? I can do whatever I want. I mean, look at, look, at, look at how intelligent we are as a human race. Look at everything that's been invented. Look at, look at how we're solving world problems. Look at, and then you can see the rationale of at how brilliant, brilliant people are. So this is the biggest idol, I think, today. And so, so now we see the wrath of God in verse 24. It says, therefore, because of all of this, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. So God lets them go. He gives them what they want. He steps aside. Here's a quote that I read this week as I was preparing for this message. Because humankind has chosen to reject the clear evidence of God's existence and rule, God has allowed the human race to demonstrate to itself exactly how devastating life can be when lived in rebellion against God. If you're going to live life in rebellion against God, your life is going to be devastated. Basically, here the wrath of God is displayed like this. God is saying, listen, you want life without me, without my word, without morality, without salvation? Have at it. Go for it. This is where we are in our culture today. This is where we are. The descent into sin has begun. I mean, look around. According to Gallup, the world is unhappier and more stressed out than ever before. Fox News recently reported that the U.S. murder rate is the highest it's been in 25 years. Public trust in government is very low, as reported by Pew Research just a month ago or two months ago. We're judging people based on the color of their skin. We're letting kids pick what gender they want to be and then giving them drugs to help them achieve that. I mean, this is insane. <laughs> Welcome to the circus. This is just bizarre. But it's, Rev it's a Romans chapter 1. I mean, we're here. Now, again, there's a lot of good people in the world that don't know Jesus. There's a lot of wonderful people in the world. But there's also some really bad ideas. And it's all part of God's wrath. And again, when I say God's wrath, don't think God is angry and he's unleashing, venting. It's not, that's not what this scripture says. Because verse 24 says, God also gave them up. Gave them up, allowing them to do what their sinful hearts want to do. Taking off the restraints, if you will. Giving them over to the lust of their hearts to impurity. God's never going to force anybody to love him. God's never going to force a relationship. If he did, it wouldn't be love. I did not force my wife to marry me. She married me because she loved me. And she still does. Praise the Lord. And there's this interesting phrase at the end of verse 24 it says to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And Paul, at this point, he's probably thinking of prostitution. In the Roman world, this was just rampant. It was a common way to worship. When I read this, I thought of Genesis. Uh, not my daughter. I thought of, <laughs> I thought of the, the book. Um, my daughter's name, Genesis, for those that didn't catch that. Um, so, but in, in Genesis chapter 2... When the devil tempts Eve, he says in, uh, let me see here. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 3, where he tempts Eve, he says in verse 1 of chapter 3, Has God said, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? The woman said, We may eat of the fruit of the trees 
but of the tree in the midst of the garden you may not eat, lest you die. And then the serpent says, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So you know the story. They go on and they eat the fruit. And then it's interesting. What's the first result of sin? Verse 7 of chapter 3 in Genesis, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And so they were ashamed of their nakedness. And then in Romans Romans chapter 1, let me get back to it here, Romans chapter 1. It says that they dishonored their bodies among themselves. And we're going to talk more about that next week when we get into the rest of this chapter. So, so this abandonment, giving over men and women to their sinful passions, just letting them go, C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Problem of Pain, explained it this way. I think this is brilliant. He says, the lost enjoy forever the horrible freedom they have demanded and are therefore self-enslaved. So sin creates its own penalty. One is punished by the very things by which he sins. Any of us that have struggled with sin know this. It's pleasurable for a season, but then you receive its own penalty. And it's not like God is saying, wrath. It's like saying, oh man, I'm just receiving the punishment for my sin. This is just what sin caused, which is why God loves us so much. He wants to keep us from that. Another writer puts it this way. God ceased to hold the boat as it was dragged by the current of the river. So God's wrath, it's not like this active retribution, but it's this removal of restraint. God says, okay, you want to do that? Go ahead, see what life is like without me. And then people are just left to their own futile thinking and darkened heart. Psalm 81, verse 11 and 12, but my people would not heed my voice. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. So it starts by rejecting this powerful God of creation. It creates this gap in your perspective. Your, your thinking becomes foolish. Your whole inner life is corrupted. And then you deify yourself. And, it, and, it, and it's this replacement strategy. I'm replacing God with, with myself. And so, brothers and sisters, here we go. To all of this, the church needs to scream, wait, the gospel don't forget the gospel. Come home. Come back to the God who made you. You don't have to live like this. I mean, there is an answer. And so, so I'm just going to wrap up today by talking about why we need the gospel, if it isn't obvious. So fascinating to me, we saw in verse 16 and 17 where it says, um, the power of God to salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. So God reveals the righteousness in the gospel. And then the wrath of God is revealed. So you see there's two revealings. There's this revealing of the power of God, the revealing of his righteousness in the gospel, and then there's the revealing of the wrath of God as people just go the way of unrighteousness. And so this is Paul's point here. That, that there's a problem, and, and he's going to expand upon this in great detail in subsequent chapters. But there's layers and layers of sinful attitudes and practices that involve the whole person. But the gospel, oh, the gospel, has the power to save people out of all of that. I mean, how many lives have been mixed up, deceived, broken, darkened, but then the gospel comes through and in simple faith transforms the life of the worst sinner. You've experienced that. I've experienced that. And so, so the wrath of God is revealed moment by moment as people run after their own passions and desires. And no matter how far they go, they can never escape the love of God who's forever praised. That's what, that's what Paul writes here in verse uh, 25 as, as he's explaining all of this. And so Paul here is defining this problem. That's the whole title of our series, The Problem Solved. He's defining the problem. He's, he's, he's 
being very descriptive and, and he's revealing this great problem that we are all living in, the need of all humanity. And now in future chapters, chapter two, three, four, he's going to show how everyone is guilty. Everyone needs the gospel. And so when you, when you look around this week or you read headlines or, or you go to work, you look at your neighbors, you see this ungodliness, you, you witness so much in our culture that, that you disagree with, that offends you, think about this passage, that it all starts with rejecting this general revelation and then the feudal thinking comes in and then the idolatry. And then think about the solution, that the power of God, the gospel is the power of God and we're not ashamed of it. And, and so, so you think about this rescue plan, the, the plan that God has. And maybe speak truth to someone this week. Whatever, however the Holy Spirit would lead you to do that. Maybe invite them to church. Or maybe even better, invite them to share a meal with you. Invite them to get to know you. Invite them to consider Jesus. This is the power of God for salvation. This is how we deal with the problem of sin in our world. I'm so thankful for the solution of the gospel.